Welcome to the Pickleball Addiction Podcast. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Dale Young to the show, co-founder of the Paddle Brand 6.0. Welcome, Cheers, Dale. Mark. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us. So I imagine it's a little bit warmer there than it is here right now, because we are at minus three. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> today was one of those uh, muggy uh, summer hot days where you're sweating in your shirt, and then it's, uh, it's broken by an <laughs> afternoon storm. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I spent some time in Brisbane, actually, when I was, a long time ago now, 20 years ago when I was younger, yeah. It was, some, it was around this time of year, it was sort of, uh, yeah, sort of Christmas kind of time. Mm. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, it was stormy then as well. So, but, um, well, I'm really excited to talk to you about your journey with Six Arrow because it's been, it's been a pretty epic journey from, from all, by all accounts, and so I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Um, but to start with, It'd be really good to uh, share with the audience a little bit about yourself and your background, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, well, <laughs> where do we start? <laughs> um, I, uh, in terms of my working career, I have an engineering degree, a process engineering by background. Um, predominantly uh, spent most of my time in water, wastewater fields. Um, and uh, yeah, spent a fair bit of uh, my time in consulting firms. And then uh, we... My partner got a job in uh, rural Africa and we moved over there and what was to be one or two years ended up being uh, a decade and uh, we were in and out of uh, Africa for that time. And then uh, <clears throat> we moved to the Pacific for a short period and then came home, had some kids. And uh, in between um, roles, I uh, uh, discovered pickleball through my mother and uh, what was to be just a bit of fun uh, turned into uh six zero and uh a full on vortex <laughs> awesome well yeah we'll take a journey down the vortex in a minute but uh, i want to just sort of touch on some of the stuff that you did in in uh, africa right tanzania was where you spent most of your time is that right yeah um uh, we moved to tanzania in 2009 and uh yeah my my as i said my partner uh she's a malaria research researcher by background and we moved uh, to the middle of nowhere it's uh, 10 hours inland um, in, a, in a rural setting um, and uh, had at the time one of the highest malaria rates in the world and uh, I went there to follow her and um, yeah it was it was uh, an eye-opener um, and um, you know one of, one of those life-changing uh, experiences so uh, yeah, I, I was basically uh, just hanging out and um, taking a little break from my own career. And um, for that first two years, I was doing a fair bit of travel in and out, learning the local language and culture and sort of observing the, the local scenario. Um, and uh, I was trying to volunteer for um, existing NGOs in the in the in what they call the wash uh, space, water and sanitation and hygiene. And I wasn't having having any luck, but when I was diving a little deeper, it, I found that there was actually no engineers working on these water sanitation hygiene projects. And that it was, uh, you know, predominantly this sort of development space where people uh, get into it and then sort of uh, shift and change uh, roles and responsibilities without necessarily having an in-depth knowledge of the specifics that they're working on. Um, and with that, then perhaps comes a little bit of protectionism um, when someone who does know what they're talking about comes along. And what I found was that, um, unfortunately, a lot of these programs that were operating in rural Africa were um, um, operating on models that were, you know, decades old, that had not been updated and certainly weren't adapted or um, suitable for the local um, environment or, or culture that they were working in. And they were just merely repeating the same mistakes and failures that they had done for the last number of decades. Um, and <clears throat> you dive a little bit deeper again and then, you know, the, the, the unfortunately, um, a lot of these bigger NGOs uh, are in a bit of a comfortable position where they're almost guaranteed a certain amount of funding 
and then you feed that back up into national government level, whether it's the UK or Australia, US, where <clears throat> unfortunately a lot of these programs aren't run well and the money is um, assigned and has to be spent. And with that comes pressure to get money spent and out the door and the accountables at the end um, sometimes suffer. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of a... Uh, a, a negative view on it all, and I am, uh, you could say, um, jaded um, by that whole development sector. But um, at that time, uh, I was younger than I am now and uh, very passionate and motivated <laughs> to try to um, get involved and, and make the most of my time in rural Africa. And my journey started when... Um, there was a cholera outbreak in our in our village and that spread out uh, across the region and the local hospital, which was a large regional hospital, uh, was overspilling with that cholera camp outside of its its gates and and um, yeah, I, I believe it was underreported at the time and, and, and anecdotally a lot of people were passing away and uh, that sort of was a real motivator for me to, to get involved and make a Make, 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 make my own effort or, or try to make my own change the best way I could. And I drew on that those couple of years that I was there, um, understanding the local situation. I spent another six months um, working in the same villages that my, that my partner's work was, was taking her, um, understanding the local challenges and uh, listening and talking to the local people. And from that was able to come up with a the framework or a loose loose framework for what I thought might <clears throat> make for some positive change. Um, at the same time, I was uh, introduced to some um, low-tech um, uh, technology and uh, that, from an NGO that was working in southern Tanzania, and this is namely uh, what, what are called rope pumps and uh, rotor sludge drilling, which is uh, all... Um, using local materials, manufactured locally, and um, creating local jobs and um, you know, creating local uh, supply chains for spare parts and materials. And then so what we did with this uh, low-tech technology was then to apply um, some very uh, basic uh, business models around water hygiene and sanitation. Um, namely, people were already paying for water uh, in their villages um, and in many cases or the majority of cases that water was coming from uh, local hand dug wells. Uh, <clears throat> the region that we were working in we were fortunate that there was a shallow groundwater table so there was no shortage of water but accessing clean and safe water was a challenge for the local people um, and mm. um, one of the reasons for that if you have a shallow aquifer and you are uh, employing a, a local well digging team, um, at the same time, you may also pay them to dig your latrine pit. And uh, unfortunately, there was a uh, trend at the time to dig the biggest and largest latrine pit you could so that you got bang for buck. Uh, unfortunately, that would often be within spitting distance of where they dug your hand, your, your drinking water well as well. And <clears throat> so therefore, you, you almost got this tea bag effect where the, uh, the shit is uh, literally um, permeating into the drinking water table and then being yeah. brought up and drunk. <clears throat> so, uh, and people were paying for that service uh, and people were paying for those families that could, could afford to put in an open well. Um, and, and, and so all we did was simply create a business model around uh, drilling a deeper borehole um, using local resources and local labor and um, creating some ownership over those assets, um, whether that was through a, fam a single family or a number of families working together to co-join and, and own that asset. And then, um, yeah, and, and then selling that water back to the community so that they then have some income to pay for any spare parts, materials, and, and also a little bit of in um, you know, um, profit on top. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that was one of the models and another one that progressed from there was almost like a, a roadside assist service type insurance policy, which was quite foreign to people in those areas, but it was uh, chipping mm. in a, a, a monthly fee uh, and then having uh, third party contractors who would 
come around and service their pumps or provide spare parts uh, if, if something broke. And that, that program is still running to this day. Um, and, and yeah, something that, that um, you know, made, made some positive change. So yeah, that, that, that's basically yeah. a, a, a shortened version of 10 years um, <laughs> of my time in and out uh, of, of Tanzania. Yeah, I mean, I was listening to your story from uh, Brian Lim when he interviewed you, and you know, kind of what you were mentioning earlier about people, you know, building, building these pumps and then not maintaining them, so they're going kind of, you know, there's no program to maintain them and, and provide. Yes. Them parts, right? <laughs> Hi, Mark Mars here. I hope you're enjoying the show. This podcast is sponsored in part by the Pickable Addiction Store and newsletter. To support the show, please check out the Pickable Addiction Store at pickableaddiction.co where we stock a wide range of paddles, balls, nets, and other accessories. Use coupon code POD10, that's P-O-D-1-0, to get 10% off your first purchase. You can also check out the Pickleball Addiction newsletter at pickleballaddiction.news, where we cover the latest news in pickleball from the UK and around the world. Thanks for your support, and now back to the show. I, I didn't delve any further into the... In, in, into the... <laughs> The, another vortex of the the, the the development industry. But, yes, certainly there's a trend before we came along to buy foreign-built pumps that were very expensive, that would eat up budget, and they could you know, cynically spend their budget um, more more quickly. Like, for example, we were doing them for uh, around $1,500, US and at the time the going rate was around twenty to $30,000 a whole. I, I don't know what it is now. I'd assume it's even uh, probably a lot more. Um, so, yeah, it was it, we we could really um, make a, a small budget run a long way, particularly when the community is contributing a third of that upfront cost and and then um, another um, third in materials, uh, their own materials such as sand bricks um, and, and then uh, labour and and so forth. But um, yeah, I mean we we obviously did uh, large education programs as well, um, operating across the size of an area the size of Switzerland reached half a million people during that time. Uh, we put in wells and, and water for uh, approximately 80,000 people um, and, and, uh, and, and sanitation uh, latrine programs for schools and families as well. Um, yeah, so that, that, was, that consumed my life uh, uh, wholeheartedly for, for that, that period. Yeah. Well, I guess there's no incentive to maintain wells if you've got a bud money coming all the time for new wells. Like, it's, it's kind of... that, that, that's a that, that's a challenge for sure. And, and this comes down to a lack of ownership too. If they're thrown in and, and plonked in, in in any location or or the discretion of the program, then there's no ownership of the asset. So if it breaks, there's an argument about who should pay for it. They form these water communities, but they quickly break down because again, there's no ownership. There, there there's no income being generated, so there's no motivation or incentive to to look after those assets. It's a sit back and wait mentality, and the, and, and that will work. The, so the the NGO or another NGO will come in six or twelve months later and come and fix your well or renovate it, or but eventually it, it slides into a spiraling um, uh, succession of failure to the point where these assets are abandoned and and um, there's thousands of these perfectly well, I, I won't go so far as saying perfectly good boreholes beneath the pumps, but in many cases there is. But you know, I can I can talk all day on this, like instances where the, these third-party contractors who were given certain funds to deal to drill certain boreholes, and they'll come in and they'll just drill a three-meter deep hole, whack a pump on it, tick some boxes, get paid, and leave. And then you know, the next season the the well runs dry. Um, uh, it, it's just, it's unfortunately endless that the, the type of um, poor outcomes that, that occur without the right type of um, program. So I mean, one focus we did, and I really was um, you know, put put strong effort into, is no matter what pump we put on top, we always ensured that the quality of the borehole we were dri drilling, uh, and we're drilling by hand down to 28 meters on average. Um, that the quality of that asset was top notch, so that it would last beyond my lifetime, so that any future pump could be in, uh, applied on top. 
Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah, there's instances where we would run our programs and then a, 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 a third party NGO with big money uh, with a, a spot, you know, it might be a rich Texan oil well guy who's retired in this particular case. And he worked through the, lo the regional government and they gave him all the GPS points for our boreholes and unknowing to him, uh, you know, he paid a lot of money for site selection for only for them to come along and drill next to our privately owned boreholes and undermine the whole program. Um, and um, right. yeah, just all that sort of stuff going on. <laughs> going on, yeah. So who ended up paying? How did you get paid? Was it the government paying? The community was paying a third. Was the government paying the rest or was it a charity? Yeah, so um, initially uh, the, the consulting firm that I worked for back in Australia, GHD, um, I, I put together a proposal and they put $15,000 towards um, the, the NGO called Msabi. Um, and that's where it started. And uh, uh, with that 15 grand, I could have drilled for um, yeah, four boreholes and done a, some education and and, and um, some a few latrines and it would have been eaten up. But then that's where we sort of how do we stretch this money? Can we uh, get make a business model out of it? Get communities to contribute and pay and, and things like that. So I think that that initial funds we got twelve wells out of that and then from there I think we dipped into some personal funds from a family and so forth, um, friends and family started donating and getting involved. And then, um, you know, then GHD um, put together some more money. And look, it just was very, very, very challenging for those first few years. But uh, through just grinding um, and, and proving a model that models that were successful in time, people wanted to work with us to the point where when we finished, we had every major international donor trying to give us uh, uh, more money than we could handle uh, and again leading back to circling back to this where they have to get rid of this money um yeah but yeah. Th th that success yeah, right. that success was hard earned and particularly challenging yeah. when you're a, 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 in, an independent um yeah, so yeah, you know, all of that sort of unfortunately contributed to my burnout, um, and um, I had multiple burnouts in, at, at the end. That sort of um, the time period between each shortened to the point where uh, I felt I was unable to to continue um, doing what I was doing, and unfortunately that pr came just at at the time when we were having sustained success, and like I said, more money that than than we could process coming through our door in terms yeah so it is what it is so you, you did you sell that business have you completely removed yourself from that business now it wasn't a, a it was never a business per se what i tried to do it was a non-profit and it, 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 i tried to uh hand over and merge the project to another larger ngo um, but at the time it wasn't um that was approved but unfortunately it fell across due to the some of the internal issues on their side uh, and then I handed over, uh, this also happened at a time when my mother had cancer. So we had to return back to Australia to, to be with her. Um, so it was a little, unfortunately, a rushed transitional handover, but we handed over to a, 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 a management team. And, and um, but yeah, the, it's unfortunately, you know, um, it, it, it's scale and size declined. Um, in, 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 when I left, um, and, but it is still running and operating to this day in a, in yeah. a smaller capacity. Yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Same, same, same. <laughs> same. Shame, yeah. But um, the yeah, I mean, what I mean, what an experience though for life, you know, that you had in those ten years that you were there. Yeah, so, it, yeah. It, you know, whilst it was, it was uh, working very hard. It was something I loved, and we really enjoyed our time. Um, living in Africa and certainly we'll be back and um, yeah look back on that period with very fond memories for sure and um, yeah whilst uh, my, my, my sole purpose was to try to make a positive difference and, and serve those local communities I obviously got a lot out of it personally uh, as well in terms of um, you know the freedom and, and the ability to do something like that is is a gift in itself
Yeah. Okay, so on to your latest venture, challenging for, for different reasons, um, <laughs> you know, starting six zero. Many um, parallels. Tell us a little bit about, about <laughs> yeah, yeah, still hard work, right? <laughs> yeah, and there's uh, still all this peripheral uh, stuff going on, you might say. It's a Wild West environment, uh, pickleball, but this, uh, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I would like to talk a bit about that and that like, paddle testing and things as well, like uh, you know, as, we, as we move on. But tell us a little bit about Six Zero and how, you know how it got started. And I guess you were, you know, you mentioned that your mum introduced you to pickleball initially. Um, but then, you know, when did you decide that you wanted to do more than just sort of play? Uh, it was pretty early on, uh, but I'd never had intent to start a business. It was the last thing that was um, on my mind at that time. Uh, this is going back uh, a good three years or more. And at the time, it was all um, what you would call cold laminated paddles, where basically paddles were um, a, 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 a polypropylene or a honeycomb plastic core is glued to a faceplate. Um, uh, and so here's a, one of our uh, current paddles, the, the double black diamond. So, uh -huh. yeah, back, in the, back at those times, it, the mo most paddles had a gritty painted textured surface um, that would wear off very quickly. They finished the face plate at the handle to save money, um, thus creating a weak point. And remember back in those days that you'd snap handles pretty easily. Um, and mm -hmm. um, it was just put together, slapped together cold uh, with glue. Uh, so I started, um, you know, couldn't help myself uh, in terms of, well, is there something to improve here, I, I mean, a simple idea would be to put a carbon edge or a, 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 an edge around the, the, the paddle and join the top and bottom faces. Surely that would make for a stronger, more robust paddle. Um, another failure point mm -hmm. at those times was um, that, you know, if you scrape your paddle on the ground, often that top part of your paddle, the face would, would crack and, and split all up around the, the, yeah. the top of your paddle there. Um, so it was a, a reinforcement type uh, um, idea as well. So yeah, I started prototyping. Uh, then I looked at various um, core materials that were available at the time, and and also tested out a bunch of different factories, just trying for fun to try and make an improved paddle. Um, and that was uh, over eighteen months um, uh, process, and that led to uh, experimenting with uh, hot mold technology and putting that carbon seam around the edge into the mould. Um, we extended the face through the handle so there's no weak point through the handle. Um, and then, yeah, obviously these raw textures came in as well around that period. Um, and then obviously the shape of this paddle is, is uh, unique with the fled, the fled um, sides, which is... Yeah, a, I love the shape of it. Yeah, it, and, and, you know, that shape just doesn't come around... Um, in five minutes, right? That was uh, six months of uh, iterative work to get the shape that I was happy with. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I still was not planning to do a business. It was just for fun. Um, but uh, yeah, I partnered up with a, another person here and um, they were keen to, to run a business. So I thought, okay, well, I'm happy to, to support you, uh, you know, starting that business thinking it would be a couple of hours a week as a bit of a hobby. And, uh, yeah, we launched this little business and then uh, sent one of these paddles off to America, uh, not knowing that we had sort of potentially changed the game and uh, got some positive feedback. And that was sort of, I think, January last year. I think I, I sent it to Chris Olsen at Pickleball Studio around October and he sat on it for a couple of months, not thinking it was anything special or, or worth um, inquiring, just another raw carbon paddle at the time. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it was a slow first few months and then it went off like a, like a, uh, a rocket ship after that once, um, once people started to get their hands on it, once pros started getting their hands on them, um, there was a lot of demand and then, um, yeah, it, it's sort of been a crazy 12 months since. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I know Chris, it became Chris's uh, go-to paddle, didn't it, once he, once he did try it. Um, so that was obviously great publicity for you there. Yeah, no, that was obviously a, a big um, leap forward for us and a, and, and a very, um, very lucky um, opportunity to have the, the biggest reviewer in the world um, using your paddle for, for the majority of this year. Um, and, and that sort of helped to affirm our standing um, and separate us from um, uh, other up-and-coming brands, uh, certainly. Hmm. Tell me a little bit about the carbon seam. I'm interested in that. You, you don't mean the edge guard for that, do you? What, what do you mean for it as the carbon seam? Can you explain that in more layman, layman terms? Yeah. Um, hang on. Okay. So, I mean, here's a cross-section of a, of a paddle for everyone. I mean, most people have probably seen this, but um, uh, so... This is actually a carbon uh, edge uh, without, so the paddle I showed you before, overlaying that to finish off the paddle, you put this plastic edge guard around. But below that, we have a, 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 yeah. a, a solid um, carbon tape that runs around the full perimeter of that paddle. And, and that leads into the new uh -huh. Infinity series that we've released, which is a full edgeless version. And that is an extension of the initial technology by adding additional layers of carbon around the full perimeter of that paddle and adding additional um, uh, layers or, or building up layers in certain areas of the paddle over other areas, if that makes sense. So yeah, um, underneath that, um, uh, on the edge there, you'll see uh, a, a, a foam cross section, almost like a half moon shape. And uh, that's encased in a, yep. in a thin layer of carbon as well. And then you've got your polypropylene core um, yeah, so that that is a carbon edge, and that runs all the way through down into the hand, handle to the base of the paddle, providing a very uh, strong um, um, unit, um, and also um, you know impacting the flex characteristics of the paddle. And, and obviously, a big game changer of these thermoformed or hot molded paddles was the additional power that they provided, or or the pop. And I believe that's a result of. Uh, uh, of the mould, uh, they're placed in at, at temperature and under pressure, and it all it, it, that that carbon seam um, uh, under pressure draws everything tighter, like tightening a drum or tightening the strings of a tennis racket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, and now that's become is your innovation, but it's kind of become more of a standard standard across. Yeah, many of the paddles now, right? Yeah, I mean, at the time there was a lot of confusion over where the technology emanated from, and um, you know, in, in my naivety, and and again, I was doing it for fun, um, but yeah, uh, in retrospect, it really should have been patenting that technology. I'd be retired now for sure, uh, and 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 then yeah. yeah, the factory released it with uh, three other brands at the same time. Uh, which caused some confusion as well over where it came from. Uh, that also makes it difficult for uh, the originator to patent it because the other brands have released it in parallel. Um, and then those brands are also making various claims as well. Um, so it took a bit of time to actually determine, yeah, whose idea was this and where did it come from? Um, and and I, I, I honestly didn't think it was that big a deal at the time. It's It's not a... It's not rocket science. It was a pretty uh, grounded, ground-based yeah. uh, type of uh, innovation. Um, yeah, similar to what the type of uh, yeah problem-solving and innovations that we were doing in Africa. You know, just identifying mm -hmm. a, a simple problem and finding some simple solutions for them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's but. Yeah, it is the simple. It is. I guess it was all in its infancy as well, because it's it's pretty obvious, right, to keep back the handle and the 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 paddle face like a single piece, right? If you don't want it to break, make it a single piece. It's like it's pretty 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 obvious, but it's, it's, so, it's so in its infancy that people haven't even done that. Yeah, you know, I hadn't done that yet. Yeah, I, and I wasn't really over it all, and and didn't understand the full impacts of what what we were doing and what would come of it. I thought it'd be a you know, a 20 grand a year hobby business at best. Um, but it, it's a full industry, yeah. this sport, you know. If you've got 10 million regular players in the States, um, that's a lot of 
gear and equipment that's required every year. Yeah. I mean, there's only, right, there's only like a handful of companies that actually do true R&D and Six Zero is one of them. Um, you know, the rest are just using the same, same mold, same innovations, right? But I'd, I'd be really interested to know about your R&D process. Well, no, sorry, if you've got something to say on that, please, please far away. But... Oh, I was just going, it's astounding that to think it was only this year that this technology launched and you think about how many brands are using this same idea now. Uh, and, and we're not even at the year's end. It's uh, 10 months and the, the Chinese are able to gear up in a, in a very short time and scale um, yeah, new products. It, it's, it's amazing. Um, and on the back of that, there's literally hundreds of new brands this year. There's a couple of every week that seem to be launching. Um, and um, yeah, you're right that um, I think it, it's apparent that um, yeah, 95, 98, 99% of them are, are, are buying from a catalogue and, and have no real understanding of, of, the, of what's involved. Um, um, other than um, picking a, a paddle from a catalogue and making a few little tweaks here and there. Um, yeah, so what do we do that's different? I mean, we, we, um, we, we have a workshop here in Australia. Uh, it's a small, um, you know, a typical Australian type of uh, backyard innovation. Uh, we, we're just working with from my dad's workshop and we build paddles there and uh, we're experimenting with new ideas, new concepts, new materials, and having some fun and seeing what works and what doesn't. And very much from a grassroots or bottom up type approach, um, build, test, pro prototype, iterate, and repeat, um, and, and sharpen the pencil basically to come up with a product that we think might um, be a follow on or, or the next progression. Um, in pickleball, um, yeah, I think the success of Six Zero to date is on the back of the reputation and the work that we've done to date on um, building a quality performance product, and people really um, have resonated to that story. Um, and um, I'm very grateful and gracious for the for for for, for this sort of phenomenon that's occurred. I have no idea, really how it's happened, but we're in it. We're here. We are at a uh, very, yeah, you know, very lucky. Um, and, and so with that, we want to continue to build on, on this fantastic start. I see a, a really big responsibility now to take six zero to the next level and to continue to, um, grow and, and be at that forefront of innovation or the leading edge of, of new tech. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, like we, I think we're, my father came around this evening. Actually, we're up to prototype seventy now uh, this year. So, uh, yeah, for example, this is one of the prototypes, and it doesn't look like much, and it's not meant to. It's uh, it, it, everything has a pretty standard um, um, base. And we don't want to uh, try to change too many things. We're looking at nuances uh, of, yeah. of small change and uh, trying to. Um, yeah, solve that and then move on to an, an, another challenge. And then we got the, then the overall challenge of integrating everything and seeing if it meshes and, mo and works together or sometimes it doesn't. Um, yeah, so that's just like one of 70. And we're getting very close now to what we're, what we're going to be happy with to, to take to production. But yeah. again, that presents new challenges itself because it's going to be a new production type line um and that will change um yeah they've obviously invested a lot of money in these factories in thermoform or hot mold production and there's a reluctance to to make any changes whilst the the, the paddles are still selling um and yeah, yeah and, and there's a risk of starting any new production line if you don't know what the outcome is going to be in terms of sales um but yeah i mean we have a fairly good idea now of what what should sell and what doesn't. Um, and yeah, we'll watch the space, I guess it will be interesting to see uh, how long it takes us to get to market with this new technology. Yeah. 
mean, I, I'm not from an engineering background, but that just sounds fun. Like, you know, to just go to a workshop and just try out some new materials and different things. So I'd love to be able to, to, to mess, mess with stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, that's the fun side of the business and um, something that I need to concentrate more on and drag myself out of the day-to-day -day operations and, uh, and, and all of the stress that comes with that uh, running, running a business like this. Without, without you know giving away too many of your secrets, I mean, is there anything you can share? But you know, when you when you you know you do an iteration, you make you make an iteration, you know, a small change to a paddle. How do you test it? How do you know that that one was better than the last one or or, or worse? What, what's the testing process? <laughs> they de they definitely do start to um, meld into each other, and uh, it is very subtle differences. Um, and because I've been working so much, I haven't been playing pickleball as much, so. It's a bit of a catch there in terms of being able to pro, uh, product test what we build and getting sufficient feedback. Um, but yeah, it, it's basically just playing and seeing if we enjoy the paddle and whether it um, ticks the boxes for the certain um, characteristics that we're looking for. It's pretty simple, really. I mean, are you trying to build a power paddle or a control paddle and then an all court type paddle? And um, what's the ingredients that, that make those? Um, mm -hmm. that, that, that bring out the flavours of the, those those characteristics that you're looking for. Yeah, and I, I mean, I assume you come, you go into an iteration with a goal in mind, or a series of iterations with a goal in mind. Like, you feel like that the paddle could be improved in some some area, whether it's the size of the sweet spot or the or the uh, uh, the, the level of control or spin or, or whatever. And, and I guess you kind of go down one of those routes. Is it is it kind of is it kind of that narrow in kind of the, the things that you're trying to improve or is it like the just the overall balance of the paddle at times? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I think it's also dictated by the type of materials that we've decided to work with and that sort of generates a general thematic of what the paddle is going to turn out like, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, there's only so many things you're going to do with a, with a polypropylene core. But, um, you know, to answer your question, I think some of the key objectives that, we set out to achieve this year was to build a more robust, long-lasting paddle, uh, to build a paddle that was okay. um, practical for, for to, to build from a construction point, so easily to scale production. Um, and um, certainly this year there's been a strong focus or demand for power paddles, uh, and, and you've just seen with the new gearbox, they've pushed that um sort of working around the legal limits of of the existing rules and, and yeah. um and so that that's you know certainly a focus is how powerful can one build a paddle but i, I think that game's going to be up in terms of changing rules and things uh, as a result of this push to drive towards the most powerful yeah. paddle um and then a byproducts of, of, of uh, a good paddle as well as it is now uh there is a uh, some demand for a quiet paddle um, or growing pressure for quiet paddles. And if that's a positive outcome of, of the tech that you're developing, then, then that's obviously a value add and, and a positive. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and, and overarching all this, if you're putting all this together, it obviously has to be better than what you've built to date. Um, but yeah, it's very much a, a, a bottom up uh, approach as opposed to some of the other um, uh, you know, new entrants that I expect that we'll see in the next 12 months. Uh, from what I'm hearing, there's, there's some big players coming into this, um, into Pickleball uh, with deep pockets. Um, but from what I've heard, it's very much a top down approach, a desktop uh, to teams of, of design engineers um, coming from different sectors and uh, designing a paddle from, from scratch from a totally new perspective. Now, whether that translates to a paddle that actually performs well on court it, it is um, to be determined. Yeah, yeah. So with that, with that in mind, I mean, do you think thermoform paddles, you know, will continue to be the standard, you say, in 24 months' time? That's a, a, an unknown. Uh, it's a very good question. You know, I think people are so fixated at this present time for the next new best thing that 
they've forgotten mm. that paddle technology didn't progress much for the past 20 years before this year. It's really been the last yeah. year and a half where paddle technology has gone from a dormant phase to suddenly uh, some raw carbon faces started to appear, Electrum uh, engage. Um, and that was a that was a Gen One carbon paddle was a that was a big game changer, and then um, yeah, then the hot molded paddles have really hit the hit in the market and taken over this year, and I think everyone's expecting them to fall away and be replaced by something else uh, in the near future, and yeah, I, I do, I do, I would. <laughs> I would like to think that the technology will have another 12 months at least, but it's unknown. Maybe it will be replaced by one of these, um, by what we're doing or by what, um, yeah, one of these bigger entrants is going to bring to market. Um, yeah, it could be, uh, yeah, it's an interesting space, but yeah, even what we're doing um, can be, a, can be, you might say, um, up, Upcycle, oh no, upcycle is not the word, but it, it could be adapted into a into a hot mold process and make for an even more um, powerful paddle. It, it's difficult for us at this end to um, produce uh, hot molded paddles because we don't have those resources here in Australia in our in, in my local environment. But what I do do is go over to China and then take some of these. Um, um, Prototypes that we that we've hand selected as as showing positive characteristics, and take them over to China. We can actually build them into the hot mold um, um, product line, and then test test that as well. Um, and that's something that, um, that that I'll probably have to go back um, shortly to do. Uh, I was only in China last month, and um, yeah, I may have to go back this month as well. But I don't have an answer to you. I don't have an answer to your um, question. I, I, ideally, I mean, I think people are quick to think that thermoform paddles might be a flash in the pan. But uh, I, I think also that that the technology will build potentially will build around um, this hot mold production. Certainly, the amount of investment that Chinese factories have put into um, hot mold production this year alone uh, indicates that there's a fair bit of inertia that they would probably want to maintain around the investment that they've put yeah. in. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, and uh, you know, over time, you've got to imagine that these improvements in paddles are going to become iteratively smaller. You know, as time's gone, you know, if you look at tennis rackets now, yes, you know, you know, there's very, very little between them. Exactly. <laughs> and, innovation and... that can continue. And in a way, you had the tennis racket, um, you know, evolution, that, which took, I'm not sure how long it's taken, but it's, it's from the 70s to now, so it's like 50 years, isn't it, um, of, of evolution to get to the, the sharpened point where they are now, right? In a way, the pickleball paddles were able to jump to that end point because of what other industries like tennis and badminton, padel have done. And so, yes, I, I think it's a big... Uh, assumption to think that there's big leaps and gains ahead of us. Um, yeah, there might be, but I think you're right. It'll be more uh, iterative, small uh, step changes from here forward, potentially. Um, if, if the thermoforming uh, or hot mold type production is is what it's built around, you know, there, there's you can do in um, yeah, there's there's some other manufacturing techniques that you can do uh, and, and some other um, new entrants are focusing on those that, that, that space, um, but it is very expensive to set up and gear that type of production and I'm not convinced that it will make a better paddle. Yeah. Uh, I, I think okay. also what we're going to see is that these guidelines and rules are likely, who knows, it's a, it, it's a complete mess at this point in time, but there's, there's whispers, murmurs, or more uh, stronger than that, that these rules are going to be potentially tightened up and then that will f significantly restrict any further leaps of innovation in terms of um, certain directions yeah. 
um, that manufacturers are, or, re, or, or companies like us are researching in. Yeah. Yeah, they're talking about the, the paddle testing there, right? And, and, and there's definitely, you know, you hear some of the pros saying, you know, you know, or even some of the influencers saying, you know, where we got to now is kind of powerful enough. You kind of don't want it to paddles to get too much more powerful because well, it would be dangerous, but also it just changes the game then as well. Um, yeah, I agree. So, I, I agree to it. Yeah, wanna... I agree to a point. Um, yeah, we, we've built uh, a paddle prototype here, which um, is, is, is very powerful um, and it would be legal. Um, but there's some reluctance or caution to release that paddle. Um, first, we'd have to find a, a process that can build it, but um, it would change the game, um, and 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 maybe not for the better. Um, but you know, if the market wants a powerful paddle, it, 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 the technology is there for it. Um, but yeah, does that make for a better game? Because, like you said, the game, the paddles um, at the moment, um, yeah, do have a nice blend of power and control and, and it, it's very I, I, I think you build one of these uh, powerful paddles um, you, yeah the, the, nobody's really been able to uh, bridge a gap between the, the, the end of control and power right uh, you know trying to bring control with a with a very powerful paddle nobody's been able to do that yet so you're sacrificing one thing for another so yeah, even if you do build a very powerful paddle, I think it, it may not actually be that popular by top players because you can't control the thing. Your, sh yeah. your, short, your yeah. short game is going to be very challenging if you get into any thinking rallies because the, 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 the spring that comes off the paddle uh, is going to be very challenging to control that in, in that controlled kitchen environment. But certainly as soon as you want to speed it up, you, you, you will have the an advantage in terms of reflex response time um but yeah uh, i don't i don't have an answer i don't i don't think uh that's where other people decide what what's best for the game but certainly i i've no intent or interest to build anything that's outside of the existing rules um or regulations uh, I, 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 all I'm asking for as a manufacturer is a clear set of guidelines that we can design to because yeah, yeah. We, we, with uh, the, the current um, innuendos of potential rule changes, etc., cetera, um, you, you're talking big, big money um, when you're trying to set out and, and develop a new product. And if, you, if the goalposts change, uh, it's extremely problematic. Yeah, yeah, hugely. Yeah, I mean, it's guidelines and paddle testing still very much in its infancy, isn't it? And that really, it's reactionary. They're reacting to what's what people are building and then putting in the the testing and the rules afterwards. Which is, you know, ultimately, not what you, we're going to want to be. Right? Yeah, well, there's that. There's there's also the premeditated rule changes, which are also catching people off guard and and not necessarily. Um, yeah, certainly raising eyebrows. For example, this new quiet um, accreditation. Uh, great, great concept, but at the same time, a brand launches with the first quiet paddle a week later after announcing the quiet accreditation. Like, that raises eyebrows. Like, how did they know about this before anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. So you, do you play pickleball still, or are you just too busy? Uh, I'd like to have been too busy this year. <laughs> I played last night for the first time in a long yeah. time. Uh, but yeah, I, I often right. my my playing now is against the brick wall testing paddles. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been chained to the desk seven days a week for most of this year. And with that, my, my pickleball suffered, my health suffered, um, my fitness has suffered, and my family yeah. suffered. So yeah, it's not all um, uh, yeah a joyous uh, experience running a small business uh, such as this. No, no, it's hard hard work for sure. Yeah, it's um, it, it's certainly hard so... work, and, and and yeah, whether whether people realise that or not, I mean, it, it, it doesn't really bother them, I guess. <laughs> 
No, no. I mean, by I, I can definitely sympathise. I've, you know, built a few startups and had the same, you know, success in, in uh, particularly in one. And um, it is, it is really hard. It's, it's great. You know, you don't, you wouldn't change it because the success is good. But you know, it does get better over time as you can then start building in more support and help for yourself. But in, in those very early stages, it comes down to you at the end of the day, doesn't it? It does. It, it does. Um, yeah, and, and there's just a lot of work putting in systems and structures around trying to, to, to meet a fast-paced business uh, and then, you know, trying to put a good team around you as well and, and to work together and, and grow together. A lot of challenges, a lot of hard work, like you said, and a lot of sleepless um, nights. But, um, yeah, we're certainly feeling feeling um, in a really nice position right now, even though there's still so much work to do. We sort of reached that sort of first, the first, uh, you might say, we've conquered the hill and we've got the mountain to climb. Yeah. <laughs> well, look forward to that then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so in terms of the future, you know, is there anything you're able to share that might be coming down the road for 6 zero that's not giving away too much? Um, Look, I think it's such a, it's such, I don't, I don't have a straight answer for that. No, uh, the, the industry is, is such a, in such a state of flux. It, it there's an element of uh, protectionism and survival. Uh, and there's, and then there's the element of uh, continued innovation and, and growth and building on the platform that we've been fortunate enough to establish in the, in a short period of time. So yeah, we we got some goals. You know that would be to be a top five known brand um, in in the states and beyond uh, by the end of next year. Uh, we'll, we'll be ramping up. We've done no marketing, advertising, or branding um, to date. Uh, it's all been organic. Uh, we've just hired a full time creative, so there'll be an element of you know, improved branding and social media um, that you'll see. Uh, we're going to partner with a with with, with some um, some large leagues, etc., and and just see where that goes. Uh, so put some investment into in, into actually building this brand name and, and, and the products behind it. And uh, yeah, so with that, I think my goal is also to free up my time and and to be able to spend more time on the product development side. And um, yeah. looking forward to releasing these. In whenever that happens, the, the, this new generation of, of paddles that we're working on, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we don't get jumped on on someone who's found out what we're doing or something, <laughs> get to release it before us again. Um, but you never know. Yeah. It's it, it, who knows. But um, I think the the goal also is to have a little bit more fun uh, doing what we've been doing as well. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah, it'd be nice to get to that point down the road. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah but that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, to work on the stuff that's the, the fun stuff and not the day to day grind. But okay, so what works out to you most about what's coming in? You know, and the growth of Pickleball in the next two or three or four months. Is there anything? I mean, I ask this question to everyone. It's really difficult because no one can. No one's got a crystal ball. But. I think, I think that the sport's in an extremely excited, excitable period right now, and, and just to see. Yeah, I don't have the answers of where it's going to go, but I think it's going to be uh, a very interesting period for everyone to be who's involved in this space at the moment and to see how it evolves and what comes of it. Uh, I think the for me that's 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 yeah you know, interesting to be on that journey and to be in the space that we are now and yeah and to see you know how how we can survive and thrive in that environment yeah versus uh-huh. versus the other scenario of of failing and yeah. falling off into <laughs> into obscurity you know uh yeah that's a fear and that's a risk yeah. but it's it, it may well happen but yeah who knows um i think what we're going to see obviously is maturity yeah it's so it's such an infant uh industry and you've got people from from garage garage brands through to billionaires all fighting for turf and all fighting for a piece of the pie. So, you know, th- th- those 
that, that I think the cream will rise to the top and the and, and we'll start to see some perhaps we'll start to see a little bit more um, um, less chaos perhaps in, in the in the next five years and and a little bit more structure and hopefully a little bit more order and, and certainty around where the sport's going and and, and you know, a vision of what it will look like in 20 years' time. Yeah, is is pickleball going to be the next uh, big NBA, NFL type sport, or is it going to follow the path of say uh, squash and uh, have a have a big rise and an even bigger fall? Yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of courts kicking around uh, in America <laughs> if that happens. Yeah, I mean. Uh, for the first time, I'm just starting to see that 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 takeoff here in Australia, where um, a, a number of people, you know, in the last week, have heard of half a dozen uh, people investing in, in, and this is just simple, small investments of transitioning tennis courts into pickleball spaces. But uh, for for the sport to take off, it needs good venues, it needs good courts, dedicated courts, and and, and it's almost like the build and they will come type type um, yeah statement. I think. Um, so yeah, we, we've sort of almost we haven't really seen that sort of exponential exploding growth in Australia at all yet. It hasn't come. If anything, it's almost stagnated. But I've, there's certainly a lot of investment and expectation that Australia's going to take off, and um, it's just starting to see see the some fruits of those investments starting to to eventuate right uh, at this point in time. Yeah. I mean, I think we're we're in a similar spot. I mean, it has been growing in the UK for sure. Um, you've definitely seen large amounts of growth, but I think Australia and UK are in similar positions because the MLP, right, have just uh, entered into Australia as well and sort of taken ownership of the league that was there. Yeah, there's two leagues here in Australia that that um, have been um, uh, started up and and um, jostling with each other, um, and. It'll be interesting to see that, where, where that eventuates as well. I think the space is, is certainly not anywhere near as mature as America. It's a good five years behind. Um, so, yeah, are those leagues a little too early or are they going to set the, set yeah. the, um, the environment or the culture required to, to create that growth that they're looking, you know, that they obviously see um, coming? Mm. But I think I saw you guys have got like yeah, 15,000 15, members in your um, governing um, body. We're, we've got eight. So it's possible that we're like half, sort of half the number of players that you guys have got as well. Uh-huh. I think that that translates to the number of clubs. I think we're around 400 clubs now or something. Across wow. The country, so I think it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, I, I had no idea. I'll have to get over there sometime. It's just so far away. <laughs> it is. It's very long. It is very far away. But yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. If you if you do, let me know, and uh, I'll sort of yeah find you the best places. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so in 2024, have you got any events that you plan to go to? Like, uh, I mean, I don't necessarily mean like pickleball events, but uh, you know, as in playing. But I mean, any events you the way you kind of kind of share the brand or, or actually talk to some people about six zero anything you've got planned for 2024 um we we do as an organization for myself personally i haven't thought beyond the end of this year in terms of my plans for for travel and so forth i've just come off the back of two big trips and uh you know that that was the first time i've really traveled since covid and um I came away going, well, I don't need to do much more of that stuff because I didn't find it overly enjoy, enjoyable as, as traveling, uh, say, pre-COVID for whatever reason that is. But uh, it, it's, you know, you're, you're away from your family and so forth as well. But, yeah, let, let's talk about 6 zero. So we, we've got a, a wholesale manager and events manager now in the States as well. So they'll be attending a number of uh, big events. We've got, uh, you know, obviously some pro players doing the circuit. So... We'll be following them around as well, but um, yeah, we, we'll be looking to uh, grow our wholesale book uh, throughout the, the US and, and Europe, as well as two sort of focal areas, and then Asia is another strong point for us as well, where we've got um, some some footholds that that we look to 
you know, just have some fun and see where the, where the journey takes us and, and step by step um, do things properly uh, and, and set them up uh, with a good structure to start with and to see, you know, how, how, how far we can grow it. Um, that, that, that's sort of what we'll be doing next year and in terms of what events and, and so forth we go and attend, I, I don't have definitive answers, but we'll, we'll, be at, we'll certainly be having a presence at, at, a, at a number of, um, yeah, big, big events this coming year. Uh, I'll probably end up in the States one, for at least one or two, three trips next year, I'd assume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, it's been fantastic talking to you um, today. Um, for people who want to follow what you're doing as a business or as a person, um, you know, where's the best place for them to go? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> You know, I'm not actually even on social media because uh, I don't have time, but it, you know, I, I prefer to stay off it. But um, yeah, our website is six uh, zero pickleball.com, all, all spelt out, not uh, any uh, new numerical uh, numbers in there. Um, and I couldn't even tell you what our socials handle is. I think it's six zero pickleball. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll 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 find them out and I'll put them in the sh- in the show notes. So that would be appreciated. Grab them, grab them that would out. be appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, follow us. Uh, um, follow us at like for... <laughs> wherever that wherever, wherever it is. Wherever it is. Follow us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks again for giving up some of your you know valuable Friday uh, evening to to talk uh, with me today. Um, it's been a real pleasure and. Uh, I'd just like to say enjoy your weekend. Well, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate the chat and uh, yeah, thank you very much.